Isn't it strange how all of these other birds are more than happy to eat my seeds and corn, but this fluffy white goose will have no part of it. What's even stranger is that he almost climbed inside of my car when I first parked, so I assumed he was hungry, but maybe he just doesn't like a vegan diet and prefers insects. So I guess I'll try to pick up some freeze-dried worms or crickets for next time. What a strange, silly goose. The white goose's reluctance to eat any seeds, while other birds and geese in this park do so enthusiastically, got me thinking about how some people are receptive to certain esoteric information and other people are so unwilling to consider any other viewpoint exists. This point was articulated in 1897 in a book called Mystic Masonry or The Symbols of Freemasonry and the Greater Mysteries of Antiquity by Jaira Dewey Buck a physician who worked to establish one of the first theosophical lodges in the United States. In it, he states that, quote, There is no fact in history more easily and completely demonstrable than the existence of the secret doctrine in all ages among all people and of the adepts or masters who are familiar with its teachings and more or less capable of expounding its principles. It is equally demonstrable that this secret doctrine was the real foundation of every great religion known to man, and that only the initiated knew the real doctrines, and only these, as a rule, in the earliest history of each religion. Furthermore, the sacred books of all religions, including those of the Jews and of the Christians, were and are no more than parables and allegories of the real secret doctrine transcribed for the ignorant and superstitious masses. All commentaries written on these sacred books, whether on those of Moses, the Psalms, or the prophets of Judaism, the Gospels of the Gnostics and the Christians, or those written in the sacred books of the East, the Vedas or Puranas, all either make more confusion when written by one ignorant of the secret doctrine, or when written by initiates, ring the changes on, or further elaborate the parables and allegories. This doctrine is everywhere, and at all times essentially the same, only the outer gloss, the parables and allegories concealing it differ among different people. If there's any truth to this belief that all major world religions, as presented to the general public, are simply a veneer covering up deeper esoteric truths, or mysteries as some call it, then what is the origin of this veiled knowledge and how far back does it go? According to Manley Hall, who was himself an honorary 33rd degree Freemason, in a 1941 article said, quote, Someday we will know that 25,000 years ago on this earth dwelt human beings of great culture who governed according to the laws of rational democracies. Not every answer to the problem lines up so simple, obvious and straight. We will know that 25,000 years ago on this earth dwelt human beings who could read and write, build cities, teach the sciences, tame and train animals for their use, build great monuments, write books, and govern according to the laws of rational democracies. In his writings called Atlantis, an interpretation, Manley Hall went on to say that, quote, the laws given by Poseidon were preserved and the race of Atlantis flourished and grew richer than all the races and kingdoms that would come after. This is the story of the golden age, so beautifully set forth by Hesiod in his Theogony. The rebellion of the angels is the story of the lost Atlantis. The same is contained in the biblical statement that the sons of God, beholding the daughters of the earth, and seeing them to be fair, descended unto them, and conceived by them a race of giants. Atlas is a form of Adam. Both names are derived from the root at or ad, 
as Adam was the first of the ten patriarchs, so Atlas is the first of the ten princes of Atlantis, and the Monad is the first and chief of the numerations. Reuben Swineburne Clymer was an American occultist and modern Rosicrucian supreme grand master of the Fraternity of the Rosy Cross, perhaps the oldest continuing Rosicrucian organization in the Americas, established in the United States in 1856. He practiced alternative medicine and wrote and published works on it, as well as alchemy, nutrition, religion, sex magic, and spiritualism. In his book, The Philosophy of Fire, Clymer goes on to say, quote, Among all the ancient people, there was both a public and a secret worship. The secret worship did not originate in Egypt, but in ancient Atlantis, and from thence to Egypt. The secret worship has always been known as the mysteries. The religious philosophy of masonry is as old as is the first religion, for masonry itself is founded on the mysteries of antiquity, which was already taught on the lost Atlantis. Ever since the time of Atlantis, the true initiates and masters have been the keepers of the great school. These initiates have taught the secret religion and true science. The ancient governments were patriarchal, the ruler was always a master initiate, and the people were regarded by him as his children. We can see that the esoteric teachings, which in Atlantis first, then in Egypt, in Persia, and in Greece, were kept from the ears of an illiterate multitude precisely because it was known that they could not, in their then uneducated and ignorant condition, understand the deeper truth of nature and of God. Hence, the secrecy with which these pearls of great price were guarded and handed on with slight modifications into the possession of those grand early Christians, the Gnostics, the so-called heretics, then straight from the Gnostic schools of Syria and Egypt to their successors, the Manichaeans, and from these through the Templars to the Hermetics, the Rosicrucians, and other less powerful secret fraternities. These occult traditions, or rather occult truths, have been bequeathed to the mystic bodies of our own times. Persecuted by Protestants on one side and by Catholics on the other, the history of mysticism outside of the Rosicrucian fraternity is a history of martyrdom. Mysticism is the belief that access to direct divine knowledge is available through surrendering the ego, which involves entering a trance-like state of consciousness, sometimes by the aid of drugs such as psilocybin mushrooms, rhythmic music, and repetitive dancing, or through prolonged tantric sex practices. The unorthodox carnal nature of achieving the Gnostic trance state is why it was historically punished by torture and death and the reason it was forced underground and veiled in occult symbolism, such as the alchemical practice of turning lead into gold, which in reality alludes to practices which have nothing to do with metals at all. Aleister Crowley was an English occultist, ceremonial magician, and high-ranking member of several secret societies, who was more open about the inner workings of some of the mystery school religions. Having founded his own religion called Thelema, Crowley wrote in 1944, quote, My observation of the universe convinces me that there are beings of intelligence and power of a far higher quality than anything we can conceive of as human, that they are not necessarily based on the cerebral and nervous structures that we know, and that the one and only chance for mankind to advance as a whole is for individuals to make contact with such beings.
who or what exactly are these beings of intelligence and power that Crowley is referring to and wanting to make contact with. While some schools of thought, such as those of the father of psychology, Carl Jung, may postulate that they were part of the collective unconscious and that when a person is in a certain dreamlike altered state, one might have access to. Crowley went to great pains to argue that they are separate beings from himself and that this intelligence is discarnate. In his book Confessions, Crowley writes, quote, the existence of true religion presupposes that some discarnate intelligence, whether we call him God or anything else, and this is exactly what no religion had ever proved scientifically, and this is what the Book of the Law does prove by internal evidence, altogether independent of any statement of mine. This proof is evidently the most important step in science that could possibly be made, for it opens up an entirely new avenue to knowledge. Of course, this sort of internal evidence has been touted by shamans going back at least 30,000 years, as they have a tradition of attempting to communicate with deceased ancestors, nature spirits, or establish some sort of connection to the other world. Shamanism is more of a method or practice than a formal religion and can be found in one form or another among all races of the Holocene. It is concerned with interacting with the spirit world through altered states of consciousness, such as a trance, and was very common prior to the dominance of the modern Abrahamic faiths. Occult authors such as Madame Blavatsky concur with the notion that shamanistic practices stretch back to the Atlantean era, when she claims Atlantis and other parts of the world were inhabited by giants. I covered the topic of giants recently and will leave a link to the video in the description. The reason for all the secrecy surrounding the topic was, according to Blavatsky, the great spiritual knowledge and power of the Atlanteans. In theosophical terminology, the Atlanteans were the fourth root race, which I attribute to the hominin called Cro-Magnon. In regards to the spirituality of the Atlantean era, Blavatsky says, quote, To continue the tradition, we have to add that the class of hierophants was divided into two distinct categories. Those who were instructed by the sons of God of the island and who were initiated in the divine doctrine of pure revelation and others who inhabited the lost Atlantis and who, being of another race, were born with a sight which embraced all hidden things and was independent of both distance and material obstacle. In short, they were the fourth race of men mentioned in the Po Povu, whose sight was unlimited and who knew all things at once. They were, perhaps, what we would now term natural-born mediums, who neither struggled nor suffered to obtain their knowledge nor did they acquire it at the price of any sacrifice. Therefore, while the former walked in the path of their divine instructors and acquiring their knowledge by degrees, learned at the same time to discern the evil from the good, the born adepts of Atlantis blindly followed the insinuations of the great and invisible dragon, the king Thevitat. Thevitat had neither learned nor acquired knowledge, but to borrow an expression of Dr. Wilder in relation to the tempting serpent, he was a sort of Socrates who knew without being initiated. Thus, under the evil insinuations of their demon, Thevdatat, the Atlantis race became a nation of wicked magicians. In consequence of this, war was declared, the story of which would be too long to narrate, its substance may be found in the disfigured allegories of the race of Cain, the giants, and that of Noah and his righteous family. The conflict came to an end by the submersion of the Atlantis, which finds its imitation in the stories of the Babylonian and Mosaic flood, the giants and magicians, and all flesh died, and every man, all except Zisthrutras and Noah, who are substantially identical with the great father in the Po Po Vu, 
or the sacred book of the Guatemalans, which also tells of his escaping in a large boat like the Hindu Noah, Vice Phosphata. If we believe the tradition at all, we have to credit the further story that from the intermarrying of the progeny of the Hierophants on the island and the descendants of the Atlantean Noah sprang up a mixed race of righteous and wicked. On the one side, the world had its Enochs, Moseses, Gautama Buddhas, its numerous saviors and great Hierophants. On the other hand, its natural magicians who, through lack of the restraining power of proper spiritual enlightenment, and because of weakness of physical and mental organizations, unintentionally perverted their gifts to evil purposes. Moses had no word of rebuke for those adepts in prophecy and other powers who had been instructed in the colleges of esoteric wisdom mentioned in the Bible. His denunciations were reserved for such as either wittingly or otherwise debased the powers inherited from their Atlantean ancestors to the service of evil spirits to the injury of humanity. In his book, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, Manley Hall asks the question, quote, was the religious, philosophic, and scientific knowledge possessed by the priest crafts of antiquity secured from Atlantis, whose submergence obliterated every vestige of its part in the drama of world progress? Atlantean sun worship has been perpetrated in the ritualism and ceremonialism of both Christianity and pagandom. Both the cross and the serpent were Atlantean emblems of divine wisdom. The divine progenitors of the Maya of Central America coexisted within the green and azure radiance of Kukamats, the plume serpent. The title of winged or plume snake was applied to Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan, the Central American initiate. The center of the Atlantean wisdom religion was presumably a great pyramidal temple standing on the brow of a plateau rising in the midst of the city of the Golden Gates. From here, the initiate priests of the sacred feather went forth, carrying the keys of the universal wisdom to the uttermost parts of the earth. In his book, Atlantis, the Antediluvian World, Ignatius Donnelly tells us that, quote, the Roman Saturnalia was a remembrance of the Atlantean colonization. It was a period of joy and festivity. Master and slave met as equals. The distinctions of poverty and wealth were forgotten. No punishments for crimes were inflicted. Servants and slaves went about dressed in the clothes of their masters and children received presents from their parents or relatives. It was a time of jollity and mirth, a recollection of the Golden Age. We find a reminiscence of it in the Roman Carnival. In ancient Rome, being born with a hooked nose was considered a sign of leadership. They were referred to as aquiline noses. The name comes from the word aquilinus, which means eagle-like giving it the appearance of being curved or slightly bent. And this phenotype feature, along with a prominent bridge, high cheekbones, and blonde or reddish hair that was common in Cro-Magnon and is said to have been revered as traits stemming from the nobility of Atlantis. Many arguments have been made that from the Atlanteans, the world has received not only the heritage of arts and crafts, philosophies and sciences, ethics and religions, but also the heritage of hate, strife, and perversion. The Atlanteans instigated the first war, and it has been said that all subsequent wars were fought in a fruitless effort to justify the first one and right the wrong which it caused. Before Atlantis sank, its spiritually illumined initiates who realized that their land was doomed because it had departed from the path of light, withdrew from the ill-fated continent. Carrying with them the sacred and secret doctrine, it is said that these Atlantean refugees established themselves in Egypt, where they became the first divine rulers. Nearly all great cosmologic myths forming the foundation of the various sacred books of the world 
are allegedly based upon the Atlantean mystery rituals. Although veiled in symbolism, these rituals revolve around various esoteric techniques that harness and transmute bio-electromagnetic energy, which in some cultures is referred to as prana, chi, or vril. It is this subtle life force energy that is thought by mystery schools to nourish the soul, resulting in heightened supernatural abilities which all living organisms innately possess to various degrees, such as telepathy, clairvoyance, and a sixth sense or intuition. While it is possible to increase the amount of this vital life force energy that one possesses, it is also possible to live in a way that unnecessarily depletes it, lowering intelligence, willpower, creativity, and one's magnetic presence. I'll cover this guarded esoteric topic again in an upcoming video, so make sure to subscribe and hit the notification bell for updates. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon, as well as through various other major book outlets. They make a great gift. If you'd like to support my work, you could do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description section for those that are interested. I appreciate it. Thank you. Please hit the like button and subscribe for future updates. As always, I look forward to reading your comments. So please leave me your thoughts below. Please have a wonderful weekend and I hope to see you again soon.